Okay, sounds like we're ready to roll. Thanks for coming. Again, who came to my session on Monday? Search session? And you came back. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so um, this session is a little bit different. I'm going to talk about some of the architectural components again in a different way than we did on Monday. Um, we're going to talk more in depth about the scale out and the um, factors around things like CPU cores and memory and that kind of thing that you need for search. Whereas on Monday, we talk more about the actual individual components and what their functions were. So hand in hand, the two talks go together and should give you a, a kind of a good overview of everything. In this particular session, we're going to talk about upgrade. And one of the key things I'm going to talk about is particularly around uh, search service application upgrade and fast, um, fast 2010s. Anyone in the room use fast? Is anyone planning on migrating fast, upgrading it to 2013, or abandoning it completely? Some of you are upgrading, OK. So um, I'm going to touch on all the points. I'm going to try and demo the fast upgrade as well. Um, I'll talk you over that point when we get to it. So those of you that, this thing's got no range. Um, for those of you that haven't been to one of my sessions before, um, my name is Neil Hodgkinson. I work for Microsoft in the Office 365 operations team. So technically part of the SharePoint product group, such as it's known. Um, more accurately now, we're kind of the Microsoft Office division. So um, it's quite a broad group. Um, my responsibility falls into Office 365 breaks in a really bad way, and I, I get a phone call. Um, and yes, I have been called by Steve Barmer, which is my claim to fame, but it wasn't a very nice phone call. Um, the, prior to joining Microsoft, I was a process chemist. Um, spent quite a lot of time, studied chemistry at university and computer science, and worked in a whole range of things, including drugs, poisons, and explosives. So if you upset me, you're not leaving the room. Um, and prior to Microsoft, again, I was a SharePoint specialist at Computer Science Corporation for about six years, working on their kind of 2001, 2003 stuff. And my contact details are there, along with a few interesting pictures. The session today, takeaway-wise, um, I'm going to try and give you some knowledge around understanding key elements of the SharePoint 2013 search service, just from a straight kind of overview, what's involved in indexing, what's involved in querying, that kind of thing. Nothing to the component level depth that we did on Monday. Um, I'm going to try and give you some information about how you can, can impart some uh, knowledge on potentially your customers or your own organizations around things you need to think about when you're upgrading search. And most notably, the things that happen when you're trying to upgrade fast or the migration capabilities we have with fast. And then I'm going to go through scale considerations. So if we're having you know, particular, we want to hit you know, certain levels of queries per second, what do we need to think about in terms of how many cores we might need in our boxes, how many boxes we might actually need. Some of that stuff we touched on Monday as well. And then the final piece, I'm going to talk a tiny little bit about search extensibility. Now, there is one guy in the room, I won't call him out, who's, who's a bit of a hot shot at this, so he can answer any questions if we get any at the end. Um, and the reason, really, for the last piece is just so I've got something to talk about while my search application's building during the demo. Agenda-wise, overview, upgrade choices, deployment, scalability, pipeline extensibility. So it's a bit of kind of basically I'm going to talk about what the, the takeaways are. So to get started with an overview, this is not SharePoint. This is generic search. So just about every single search engine on the planet falls into these categories or has components that, that, that serve these, these roles. Basically, it's a cycle, and it's all about content that gets changed on the, on the disk or on the shit in SharePoint, on the file system, whatever it might be, gets picked up by an indexer, is, is broken apart, is indexed, is added to a, some, some form of search engine keywords um, container. And those keywords can be queried against to pull, pull back the entries that, that will take you back to those original documents, so nice and simple. In terms of SharePoint, it looks quite complicated. It's actually all the same. From a, a cyclic perspective, we have the same components. We're crawling over on the left-hand side. We're querying over on the right-hand side. All our keywords and everything is stored in the middle in the search index. SharePoint 2013 has some additional pieces, so the analytics processing engine. And they get involved in querying as well. They also get involved in indexing time. So if we look at the individual pieces from a querying perspective or from an indexing perspective, these are the components we're really concerned with. So the connection side um, is really about the, the content that we can go and discover. The crawl engine is the piece of the pie that's going to go and, go and collect that information, go and gather that information. And then in the middle, if you're familiar with SharePoint 2010 search, the content processing aspect will be new to you. That's a fast, um, well, formerly a fast idea. Um, in 2013, we brought that into the, into the product, or we've adopted the FAST mechanisms for that. 
and the content processor is responsible now for loading the eye filters and the format handlers and everything that will actually break the content apart, do the word breaking, do the linguistic processing side. And in the middle, the on-disk index, and that's where you're going to need the, the disk space to support the index capacity. We also, there we go, we also bring in, from a crawl perspective, we have to think about things like the analytics processing as well. The analytics processing engine is part of the, the search engine which will, as well as doing the analytics and usage stats, from a search perspective, it's going to do things like processing links, processing connectivity between documents and between elements. So we have this concept we call the anchor crawl process. 2010, it was a real pain. We have moved the anchor crawl process out into 20, in 2013 into the analytics engine. So the analytics engine is now asynchronously taking a lot of load off the search engine, which enables the search engine or the indexing side of the search engine to do a lot more work in a quicker way. And it's one of the key elements that gives us the ability to do this new thing called continuous crawl. We couldn't do continuous crawl if we didn't use the analytics engine as part of search. From a query side, fewer components really. Web front end, obviously, where your, your search APIs are. We have a query processing component, which is now obviously which is a, a, a fast element in SharePoint. The query processing component was, was effectively part of the MS Search XE process. I was, a, to all intents and purposes, a SharePoint service in 2013. It's a discrete service in its own right that operates under the Node Runner um, component we talked about on Monday. And then in the middle, there's the on-disk index, where we actually go to query and retrieve those results. Again, analytics takes, takes part into this. So in SharePoint, when you're doing queries, you'll notice you'll get responses back, like um, recommendations, queries you've done before. So for example, if you've searched for a document, and you found that document, and you want to go back to the search engine and think, I, I, used, I found this document using these particular keywords. The search engine using the analytics processing and using your part of your profile information can tell you things you previously found based on keyword searching that you're doing. And the mechanism is driven by analytics and calls on the user profile service application, calls on uh, the search service and the on-disk index. So that's kind of as really all I want to talk about in terms of the architecture. The session on Monday covered that in, in a bit more detail in terms of what the components are. What I really want to get into is upgrading search. Anyone got young children? No prizes, but do you know the character? Do you know what he's called? <laughs> upgrade. <laughs> so this is Upgrade. So we're going to upgrade Search to 2013. In 2010, or upgrading Search 2010 to 2013 is actually really simple. In fact, it's so simple that I reckon my five-year-old could actually do it. It really is easy, as long as you don't haven't done anything weird with the databases. Um, Fast, on the other hand, I say very complex because it is quite complex. It's particularly painful um, if you don't use the right tooling. There is no out-of-the-box way to do it. You can't just take your um, fast admin DB and run an upgrade service application or a new, new search service application against it. It isn't going to work. So what we have um, as part of, the, part, of the, sorry, part of a product group team within Microsoft, uh, an MCS, PFE, and product group initiative, we built out a set of scripts. And I'm going to show you some of these scripts later. These scripts do PowerShell queries against the search service, the fast search service. They do SQL queries against the SQL databases. And they do read and write queries to create you a search service database. So effectively, they transform the fast search configuration in terms of the property store, sorry, the, the metadata uh, managed properties that are inside fast, the, the um, configuration of anything to do with scopes or um, content sources, all of that information that's stored inside the fast DBs and the fast and the search service application DBs is transformed into a format that's identical to a 2010 search service application. And then we can literally take that database and upgrade it. And I'm, hopefully I'm going to demo that for you in a few minutes. In terms of what's supported, oh, and just to cover off those scripts, by the way, um, yes, they do write actions in SQL. Yes, they write to databases. It's got that script, those scripts have product group blessing. It's the one and only operation you can do in a supported way that allows you to write to SharePoint databases, except the usage DB, which you know about anyway. Upgrade paths, so there is no fast anymore. Okay? I know when we were delivering Ignite content, kind of over the last 12 months for SharePoint 2013, almost every class we ever delivered, somebody always stuck their hand up and say, What about fast? Okay, please don't ask that question. Fast is gone. 
Um, even the versions of FAST that we had previously, the ESP version, the FAST for internet sites, there is no upgrade path for those. You either continue to use the version that you have, which will eventually go out of support and you won't be able to maintain it, or you just bite the bullet and migrate. On uh, internet capability, so I say the, the fast ESP services, fast for internet sites, there's no option there. Microsoft Search Server is also gone. So there is no search server capability anymore. We don't have a Search Server 2013. Your option is to use Foundation Search or use Search Server if you want the full blown, oh, sorry, use SharePoint Server if you want the full blown capabilities. My clicker's playing up. And entry level wise, as I said already, from the Search Server's perspective, in SharePoint Online world, these kind of acronyms don't really make much sense anymore with the old 365 terminology that we use. Well, basically in Office 365, either whether you're Office 365 dedicated or Office 365 multi-tenant, you don't really need to care about it. Hopefully we'll take care of that for you. Although your UI, there might be some interesting things you need to do in the UI, which there's plenty of other sessions um, this week covering that stuff off. For 2010, the actual process of search upgrade is, as I said already, relatively simple. There's quite a few steps, but if you look at what the steps are, it's really quite easy. You back up your search admin DB. Take the one out of 2010, back it up, restore it to SQL. Um, preferably on a, you know, another SQL server. You could leave it where it is if you wished. Install your 2013. So we build, we're building out our 2013 farm. We restore our copy of, this, of the database, and then we run Restore S Pre Enterprise Search Service Application to create a new service application. Now, if any of you have done upgrading service applications, not, not the search ones, but for example, the managed metadata, the user profile store, you'll notice that search is the only one that has the restore option for this purpose. In, we have a new as well to create a new one, but if you do new search service application using an existing search service DB, you can run into all kinds of problems. Then you configure your search topology because no matter what topology you had previously, if you had say a, you could have had the biggest search enterprise search topology you've ever seen, once you upgrade that search service administration database, you're condensed down to one server again. Okay, so all of you, you'll end up with a default set of search components on one machine. So one crawl component, one, one content processing component, one query component. And we don't upgrade the index, of course. So you're into full crawl scenario now. And that's pretty much it. If you're looking at service farms, and I'll, I'll go through this in a diagram, diagram later, if you're using search service federation or um, service application publishing features, capabilities, you need to upgrade your services farm first. And that's a general guidance for all service applications if you're doing cross-farm publishing. SharePoint 2010 farms can consume from 2013 search services. They cannot go the other way around. So if you upgrade your content farms first and your search farm is still in 2010, you just killed your search. Okay. So the way we work with the services farm, pretty straightforward. We've got our search services farm at the top and our content farm down at the bottom. We would, first thing we would do is have our content farm pointing to the search services farm. So that's kind of your out of the box configuration if you're using cross farm publishing. We need to upgrade the 2010 services farm first. So you need a, a stable 2013 search service platform. At that point, you would actually then crawl all of the content in the 2010 farm. So you're building your search index up in the 2013 search service inf uh, infrastructure. Then you repoint the 2010 farm at 2013. At that point, you, your, your search services continue to work as normal and you're consuming from the search 2013 index. You can then go through the process of upgrading your 2010 farms to 2013. That process is exactly how we do it in Office 365. So we, use, we, call, we refer to it as swing upgrade. And that's how all of your 365 multi-tenant farms are being upgraded. We swing them around to different farms all the time as we go through upgrade processes, not just for search, but for everything. Once you're in uh, SP 2013 on your, on your content farms, you then point the content farm back at SP 2013 at the services farm, because obviously it's a, it's a migration process. And then this final step really is saying, in your, when you're in SP 2013, in what we call generally refer to as 14.5 mode, which is kind of a hybrid between your, just you've got some sites in 2010 mode, some sites might be in 2013 mode. When you bring everything over to 2013, you're then good and you're basically in the same configuration you were in at the start, but with everything running in 2013. So it's a fairly, it's, just, it's a relatively simple process. Um, you shouldn't run into any issues if you go down that route. For um, the actual 
search upgrade itself, there's a number of things which do get uh, migrated with the upgrade and certain things that don't. So in scope for a 2010 search, so if you're upgrading SharePoint, just pure SharePoint search, everything that isn't listed below. So search topology settings, the index and any custom code, any connectors, um, any eye filters you might have installed, any uh, custom security trimmers, for example, all of that's gonna get lost as part of the upgrade process. And that stands to reason. It's custom code on, on the system. But the um, other things that do get included from a SharePoint 2010 perspective are things like, well, we, we bring scopes across, but they're not usable. Because 2013 has this new feature called result sources. So you can still go and look at your scopes. You can still go and, and look at the configuration of them, see what rules were in there but they're not gonna be used. You need to go and rebuild those as, as result sources. Um, from a content perspective, pretty straightforward. Once you've gone through the whole process of upgrading your, your search service application, from a search center perspective, we'll provision a new 2013 search center when you upgrade the search center in, from 2010. Um, the customizations within that search center though will be lost. So I know there's been some sessions this week. I know Matt and Agnes and John Holiday have done some sessions on search and the UI side of things. Um, they'd have probably covered off quite a lot of this stuff around you'd lose the XSLT capabilities because we're using new things like dis called display templates which are used to, to, to um, give the look and feel to the user interface. For fast, this migration tool, I've put a great big red cross against it because at the party last night, I, got, I had him in a conversation with a, fa with a fast guy from Oslo um, basically because when I was trying to do, work on this demo yesterday, the tool, the scripts are all broken. The ones that we've published publicly do not work. Has anyone tried them? One person. Did it work for you? No? No, no? okay. So they're, um, if you download them, well, you can't download them now because last night they got, took, they got taken down off TechNet, but they will publish new ones out. Um, and it means that the demo I'm going to do is kind of a halfway house, but we'll, we'll, I'll show you that when we come to it. But it's effectively a very similar process in that we're, we're really concerned with our SQL servers and our SQL databases, and that we back up all of our search service application databases from FAST. So if, you, if you're familiar with FAST for SharePoint Search 2010, there will be two search service applications, one for the content processing, one for the querying side. We take elements of both sets of databases, and then we run them through these scripts which merge that information into a, a number of XML files, and then we push the XML data into a new search service administration database that we then upgrade in exactly the same way as we did with 2010. So there's no difference once we get past these scripts. The difficulty is the scripts. They don't work so well at the moment. Um, Process-wise, so those are the databases we're concerned with. But basically, it's the three administration databases. So it's the fast server admin, which is part of the fast server infrastructure, it's the fast query search service application administration database, and it's the fast crawl search service administration database. So property DB we don't care about. Um, crawl DBs we don't care about. We just abandon those, JSON those. We're more, all we're interested in is the actual settings within the administration services. And then they get pushed across through this spinny wheel thing, which is a bunch of PowerShell and SQL, to give us our new search service application DB. In terms of my, oh, that's interesting. Sorry about that. Um, in terms of in scope and out of scope for fast, I've put a little bit more detail in because it is a bit more granular. There's a whole bunch of stuff that is in scope, as you can see there. Things get migrated across, um, crawl properties, some managed properties, uh, content sources, all that stuff comes over. But specifically out of scope, um, are probably some of the things that those of you that have fast deployed fast for some of these reasons. Some of the inclusion, exclusion rules, customization pieces, the pipeline extensibility capability that FAST has, you're going to lose all of that. So you're going to, you, you have to really just expect the fact that that, that that capability is going to be lost. And this, as they build these scripts and refine these scripts, they're trying to get more and more of these features to come across. Obviously, some of them are right out. We can't do it. The, the SharePoint 2013 search simply doesn't support it. And then your final piece, content site upgrade. Well, you just, if you're in the session, the last, in fact, the two sessions previous to this with uh, Ari and Chan, you'd have gone through that process in quite um, significant depth. And we're going to look at this um, process. Come on. Right, OK. I'm going to demo it. I'll try and demo it. So with FAST, as we said already, the process involves a set of databases. Let's see what this resolution's going to look like. 
So what I've had to do, the, because the scripts don't work, in fact, let me just get rid of that. Sorry about this. I don't need that anymore. Because the scripts don't work, I, couldn't, I can't run them. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to show you what they look like. So the scripts consist of basically four um, very simple, well, not four relatively simple scripts. There's an environment script, there's a migration script, a property script, and then there's a restore web app script. The restore web app script you only need if you want to migrate a web app that's full of search, search centers, for example. You can migrate that at the same time. The environment script is used simply to set a bunch of environment variables, and those are down here specifically, where we're just looking at things like what's our search service administration database called, what's the new one going to be called, you know, so you're just controlling the script basically. The migration script is the actual heart and soul of the, of the, the actual uh, process, so this script is the guy that's going to go through those databases and extract all those components, extract all the information, build a set of XML files to be able to then inject that information into the new search service application DB. Like I say, these are full of bugs. I'm going to give them to Victor after to fix them. So. Uh, and then the install properties one, this is the guy that's just doing the, the managed property pieces and some of the crawl property pieces. And the restore web one, we don't really, not really too concerned about this. Like I say, this is the guy that's um, effectively takes a, a web application back up and will restore it and then upgrade the search centers for you. Like I say, those scripts don't work, so I've had to take a previously run one. So on my file system here, I have conveniently 14.5 search service application DB. This is a database that was created from a working set of those scripts that I previously had. Unfortunately, I don't have them with me, so I can't talk it through you. So um, the, key, the first thing we need to do is restore that database. So very straightforward, usual SQL stuff. Make sure I get the right name or the rest of the demo will break. Okay. And true to not best practice, I'm running my search services as a, as a Local admin on this particular set of, on this, uh, as a domain, not as a domain admin, sorry, but as a, an administrator on this particular set of uh, servers. So I just need to make sure that I've got the permissions set up right. So if I just check my logins, and I'm fine. So my administrator is all set up right, we're good there. And that's all I really care about in terms of restoring that database. And then the next thing to do is from, excuse me, from PowerShell, go to my SharePoint server. You see we have no search service application in here. And from the SharePoint server side of things, oh, this, you, I hate this resolution. <laughs> Let me uh, shrink that down. So at least we can get something on the screen. Okay, so I have no SharePoint, I have no um, search service application. All I'm gonna do is do a restore of the fast search. Now, before I can do that, I need to do some other things like create an application pool, create a services application pool for it to run in. So nothing unusual here. Most of this is what you would do normally when you're provisioning services. And all I'm going to do is run through this guy, and hopefully everything's going to work. It prompts me for creds. So those are the creds for the service application pool. And then start my services. I'll get my services, should I say? What's that error? Sorry. You could have told me there was an error, guys. What? It is a managed account. Okay, so it's complaining that it already exists. Let me just put, keep pushing on it. So I'm just going to check the status. True to form, this worked just fine earlier. So my status is online. And then the last thing I need to do is just provision uh, the search service application using a restore. So 
So while that's running, that's going to take a few minutes just to run through. That will provision the search administration DB, provision my SharePoint 2013, all of the other search components like the links DB, the report, the uh, analytics reporting engine, all those kind of tools, that, that all kind of components that we would get inside the search service application. And it's all done from fast. So as I said already, there's a lot of stuff that's out of scope that we would normally have, you would have in fast that we don't have now. Well, this thing just takes a few minutes to run. And then once it completes, we'll create the, pro the proxy, as long as it completes. We're just going to check central admin to make sure it's actually there. Question. Yep. No. And the best bets that are brought over, they're brought over, they're not brought over as query rules, they're brought over as conventional best bets. They're, that's a good question, actually, Matt. I need to. I tried that, but I saw it on your slide. It said that we do, we do bring them over. Um, the, if I remember correct, I can have, we can have a look at it, see what we actually get, we could try it. But, um, we'll certainly get that answer for you, so, yeah. Another question? You could do it. With, you could extend the scripts with power with some more PowerShell to, to to recreate your result sources. Well, assuming you, yeah, you should be able to. So the scopes that you bring across are not available. You have to create you have to recreate them as result sources. Okay. No, they're just there purely to show you what they were previously. I'll show you in the UI here. So that's the, the search center has been created. I'll show you the, the service application is created. All I need to now is just create the proxy so we can actually use the thing. And really straightforward. If I go into the, into the service application itself now, we have our form of fast search and even though the URL, uh, go away. Even though the, the UI is a bit, oh, good, interesting. <laughs> oh, great. All right, this demo could get even more fun. Um, let's see what we have. So from a scopes perspective, scopes are converted, are changed to, we have these concepts of result sources now, but we can still go in and look at our scopes. So these are the scopes we had previously. The one called evolutions is one I created when I was building this demo the first time around. If you're writing code on the 2010 side to, to talk to a, to a 20, or to consume a 2013 search service, yeah. you're going to need to, some of the code needs to be readjusted. Yeah, so you can't just use 2010 existing uh, drop down box to choose the scopes. Uh, change the SSA to a. Oh, I see where you're coming from. Um, you certainly can't create new ones. And you can't edit the existing ones. You can look at them and see what the configuration is. So you're probably right. I'm going to have to hold my hands up and say that that's probably a very good assumption. But I'd have to hold my hands up and say, you know, it makes sense. Right, now, now I get this, the original question. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a scenario that I haven't tested. I haven't tried it. But it would make sense, given that a 2010 farm can consume from 2013. The, the only other thing, if you, if you are looking from a customization perspective, you've got to consider that your, the actual language syntax you use has changed. So, for example, you can't use the SQL language syntax anymore for querying against SharePoint search. You're restricted to uh, KQL, the keyword query language, or indeed, FQL still in the product, but you need to you need to flick a switch to, to enable that feature, to enable that capability. So, but yeah, I get where you're coming from. I appreciate the question. If I had a great piece of swag to give away, you'd get it. 
All right, it looks like this, I'm going to, hopefully this is going to start to work. I've run this demo, for, oh, there we go, so we're up, the services are up. So we have our components all installed on one machine. We have a single index partition and we have our set of databases. So that's created simply from that one DB. That's kind of run through the process. We are really short on time. Let me keep going. Okay, the next demo is more interesting. Um, so deployment and scale. These, did anyone go to, anyone go to SharePoint conference? Did anyone go to Barry Wallbound session at SharePoint conference? On search scale, no? So this is good, because this, this stuff's come from, most of this stuff's come from that session. In terms of the, okay, we just did that. Um, in terms of scale out and optimization, um, there's an awful lot of work being done in the search team, in the product group, or the search teams right now in Oslo, to, t to discover and realize exactly how we build SharePoint in terms of scalability. What do I need in terms of if I want to achieve a certain number of queries per second? Which components are work in harmony with others? You know, which components can share the same machine? How many of those components can I have there? What CPU core power do I need? What memory footprint do I need? What disk footprint in I.O. do I need? All that work is in flux. What I'm gonna give you here is hopefully some guidance around the kind of best, best approaches we have, have today. So the key thing about SharePoint is, from a search perspective, it's scalable in multiple ways. So not only the content volume, but also the query load and the crawl load. So queries in terms of queries per second, crawl in terms of documents per second for the filter rate. Everyone wants their, their document to be saved to SharePoint now and available in the search index right now, okay? which is kind of almost an impossible dream. The other thing to think about with work SharePoint search is that it supports multiple workloads. So from a SharePoint collaboration perspective, the search, the search experience there, or certainly the search workload there, is very different from, say, for example, an internet site or a website, where the search aspects may be, may be considerable. You may need to support many thousands of queries in a short period of time. And then Exchange, so Exchange 2013, different workload. The Exchange 2013 platform contains SharePoint search engine. We've taken the old Exchange one away. And then Office 365. And the usual question that comes out now is, where's my content by search web part? Um, Office 365, the content by search web part is going to be turned on at the point that this testing is done. So we use federated search farms. There's a number of federated search farms inside the Office 365 infrastructure that support all of the other farms. There's, many, there's millions of tenants in Office 365. If everybody turned the content by search web part on at the same time and decided to start playing around with it and experimenting with it, we have no idea what that would do to the federated search farms. So we don't turn it on purely to avoid giving you a really bad experience of crushing everything else that happens with search. But it is coming. And that's as much as I'm going to say about it. So no, no questions on that one. Um, from a scale out perspective, we can scale all of these components. So query processing side, index, crawl, content processing. Every single part of the, part of the, 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 the infrastructure is scalable. Even, we can even add additional admin components. It's not really a scale point, it's more of a HA issue, but we can have multiple, um, multiple admin components as well. And all of them have various degrees of, of decision points on, well, what do I need to achieve with that component? What, what's my objective? And mainly the key thing is, what is the business expecting the search engine to do? You know, am I expecting to be running thousands of queries every, every few minutes, or am I just gonna be ticking along as an intranet portal that might get four or five queries every minute? In terms of the scale out then, this is kind of the, the nerdy stuff. Um, from a query processing component perspective, the driving factor that we're looking for is how many queries per second and how many query transformations. So query transformations are changes that occur within, when you issue a query into, into the SharePoint search engine, you can build these query transformations that can do other things with your query. Like for example, add additional rank points to, to certain things or modify the query to include additional search terms. And depending on how complex that, that workload is, how many queries per second you want. So if you take, I mean, a classic queries per second number. Um, at Microsoft, we have an internal portal called MSW, Microsoft Web. The, it, has a, it actually still has a fast, no, it's now uh, fast, sorry, it's that again. It now has a SharePoint 2013 search infrastructure behind it. And it receives, considering there's 115,000 people working at Microsoft, the query rate is four queries per minute which is really low, okay? 
So that's typical of an internet search application. May, on the other hand, it could be a, you know, a business application that's out on the internet, something like bestbuy.com, that's probably receiving thousands and thousands of queries, where the, the, you know, the workload is different, the, driving, the drivers are different around what you need to build. And this is the driver that affects us for the query components that we have inside the Office 365 farms. We need to understand the expected query load from turning the content by search web part on, which I promised I wouldn't talk about again, on these farms. So how many of these guys do we need? And how many CPUs do they need? And how much memory do they need to be able to support what you guys want to do? From a network perspective, driving force factors, number of index partitions, and the size of the queries. So the number of index partitions comes in purely because we need to transfer data around. There's data flying all around between the SharePoint servers, the crawlers, the index partitions. And we need to understand that, 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 that metric. And then the size of the queries. How many results are we pulling back? Is, is kind of the key thing there. Bit of an example, if you're running 20 index partitions, which is an awful lot, at 20 queries per second, you could expect 200 megabits per second in and about 100 megabits per second out. That's kind of an expected workload on the network. But that's, a, that's kind of a high number. Most, most people will be running you know, gigabit bandwidth networks. You should be. If you're not, you should be. Um, so that, but it just gives you an idea of expected load. 20 queries per second is very high for an internal intranet application but it's fairly low for a, for a web business. So just be, just be aware of that one. Index component. So this is the guy that's actually the on-disk, if you like, component that's receiving updates from crawl and is giving out data to the query processing components when it receives search queries. So these are just guidelines. Very difficult to think about things like um, you know, queries per second, how many items and cores we need. But these are metrics that have been given. Just as uh, Think of them as rules of thumb right now. So typically, if you're deploying a server to, ser ser um, to serve as an index component, the chances are an off-the-shelf box from a server side is going to be what, 8, 16 cores, um, significant amount of RAM. So you're not really going to run into too many concerns with smaller size farms. As your farms get bigger, if you start going out to the 20, 30, 40 million items, you need to think about how you distribute those query partitions, because they will have a significant effect on what we call query latency which is the speed of query response. And then disk load, driving factors again, queries per second and item count. So we need to think about how many items we're retrieving back, how many items are in the index itself, and how many queries we're submitting those, those partitions to. So on Monday, we talked about the concept of replicas. By adding additional replicas of, in, of the index component to the, to the farm, you can increase your throughput in terms of queries per second quite significantly. I hate to talk about IOPS. Spence isn't in the room, is he? No, we throw something at me. Um, thinking about IOPS is always difficult because it doesn't really mean an awful lot in terms of um, kind of well, what does it mean to me. So the reason that I've only really left it in because it, it's kind of a almost like an industry standard recommendation. I need so many IOPS. I mean, so many spindles or so many um, so many disks. And this is really just trying to give you an idea of of the type of load that you could get on a server. So if you look at the query load, for example, you would expect to see about, um, about 30 reads for every single query. Without a crawl, if crawl's not running at the same time, so three reads per query. And then if you're doing index merging, which we get always at the end of a crawl, or you can, you can trigger that on demand, index merging will put a significant load on the disk as well. So if you run into scenarios where you're getting disk bottlenecks, you can seriously expect the search crawl engine or the search index to, to suffer. So we should have a recommendation that the, the index component should ideally reside on its own set of disks, or the, disk, the, sorry, sorry, the file system associated with the index component should reside on its own set of spindles, if possible. Interesting thing with, with this index, because the on-disk index is the single component, really, that is a moving part, if you like, for both query and crawl, you can't you can't measure one without the other. So you need to know how much query load you're putting on there and how much crawl load you're putting on there. And as we say always when you're measuring performance, factor for the worst case. So how much, I, how much infrastructure do I need to provide when I'm crawling and querying at the same time? And make sure that you can, you can surface those or serve those workloads um, sufficiently. Come on. From a crawl perspective, um, again, interesting in terms of the, the load now. The crawl component in 2013 is significantly lightweight 
by comparison with 2010. So in 2010, the crawl component or the MS search exe process that was hosting the crawl component would be literally could flatline a server very easily in terms of the document processing side of work that it's doing and the, the, the crawling or the gathering side. Now the crawl component is only responsible for crawl. All it is doing is reaching out over the network using whatever protocol handle it needs to use to connect to that source, grab that information, bring it back to the crawl component, store it in a file share, and that's it. It doesn't do any, it doesn't do any indexing, it doesn't load any I filters, it doesn't load any format handlers, so it's not doing any of that hard work that it did previously. It does still have a memory leak in it though. So you might find you've got some issues. If you're running a crawl for a really extended period of time, you might run into a scenario where it starts to consume a significant amount of memory. And in that case, the, the, the process to fix it is just recycle the service. It's stateless, it works, it picks up where it left off. Driving factors, so think about where you're downloading items from. Think about the network bandwidth requirement for that. If you took me, I gave an analogy on Monday, or a little story on Monday where um, I had a customer that I used to work for, which um, when I was in PFE, who asked me to crawl their intranet with a SharePoint crawler. Their intranet was running on a quad proc Pentium Pro 200, and I hit it with about 200 threads of crawl, a significant amount of crawl, and literally did a denial of service attack on their internal uh, infrastructure. So just be aware that these can be very aggressive, so make sure you've got the appropriate network capabilities, and the targets that you're actually hitting are capable of receiving the load. Okay, and if not, look at crawler impact rules that we looked at on Monday and how to throttle that back. And then from a disk load perspective, all docs temporarily stored in a data folder. Key thing there, make sure you're not scanning that with antivirus engine because you will cripple the search engine if you do. So make sure that's in your exclusion rules. Content processing. So now we've done our crawl piece, we've gathered our documents, we're sending that content over to the content processor to, to actually process. And driving factors here again, docs per second and the size and complexity of those documents. In 2013, we have a number of format handlers, and they are responsible for um, what, what all the eye filters used to do, if you like. We still have eye filters in the product as well. We've replaced a lot of them with what we call format handlers, and this is the guy that loads those. This is the guy that's going to take that document, cut it all into little pieces, do the word breaking, do the, do the linguistics processing. So it's doing a lot of heavy lifting. And network load again, it's receiving information from the crawl component, or it's just a, it's collecting information from the crawl component, and it's also pushing data down into the index component. So don't, don't skimp on your network infrastructure. From an analytics side, it's very similar in terms of how many items am I going to process? How many, how many, um, report, how much, how many reports do I need to process? How many links do I need to find and actually analyze as part of the processing engine? So it's, it's all pretty much the same kind of numbers, you know? Think about the, the local disk. The analytics engine gathers usage reports of all the web front ends. The web front ends talk to the search service application proxy, and they push files through that proxy or via that proxy to the analytics engine. The analytics engine picks those up. So when you see those little usage files in SharePoint that, you, that appear inside the same folder as the ULS logs, they're going to get collected by this guy and processed. And they can be pretty big. You know, they can put significant load on the system when they're being processed. And then the admin component, you can put that absolutely anywhere. It's very lightweight, very low CPU and network requirements. Um, it will gain load as you have more items in the search topology. The reason being all of the components inside the search topology check in with the admin component to set, check their status. You notice when I, when I did that initial first demo and we got all those red Xs, that was the admin component not being able to communicate to all the subcomponents because they hadn't been provisioned yet. So we were getting the red Xs. Once they're provisioned, you get the green check and they're op operational. So as you have more and more components, you're going to see that load increase, but it's, it's very lightweight. The admin component can reside pretty much with any other component in the system. So these, sli these slides you would have seen on Monday, really it's kind of a crib sheet. If there's one takeaway in terms of where can I host components and where can I put things, this is the one slide you want to remember. So really what we're saying is, if I have a component that's got say, three stars for CPU, I don't want to put it alongside another component that's also got three stars for CPU because they're, they're going to have contention. So that's an important one. So typically you search administration, for example, as I said, it's one star across the board. You can host it anywhere. The crawler, you wouldn't typically host a crawler with an analytics processing component because they're both very heavy on network. You wouldn't host analytics processing with, or you wouldn't host content processing with an index because they're both heavy, heavy on CPU. So just use that as a kind of rule of thumb. This may change and morph over time, but as of right now, this is, this is 
I won't say the best guidance we have, but if you follow this you know, appropriately, you'll be fine. And I've got a few other bits. and So yes, well, if you're you, so any if it's if if any element has in this case three stars, three stars means it's a heavy consumer of that resource. You so no, you could have one. So so you would if you were, if you were going to share no. In the ideal world, every search component would be on its own separate server, right? But that's completely unrealistic. No one has that. Most people don't have that much money. So you would realistically think, well, where can I compromise? Where can I share my resources? In 2010, we shared lots of things. In 20, 2007, we shared everything. So you would think, well, OK, well, what can I do? I'm going to put my, in fact, let me go to the next slide. This, let me build this out. This gives you kind of a, a guide of what you can and can't share. So what we're saying is content processor and analytics processor, because the content processor is here, and our analytics processor is here. Three and two, not ideal, but acceptable. Yeah, there's never a three and three together. So when you're a he very heavy consumer of one resource, you don't want to have another one with the same level. And this, this is by no means prescriptive. It's generally whatever works for you. You might find that you're, cr you're crawling very infrequently. So you can share your crawl components with some other components, with query processes, for example. It all depends on what your individual requirements are. So in terms of scalability for size, and scaling for, for components. You've seen these on Monday. Most of this stuff's for reference. It's all available on TechNet. So I'm not going to, you know, I would recommend that you don't use these slides as reference guides if you're going to go and build something. Get the latest information off TechNet or employ a reputable consultancy to do it for you. Um, <laughs> so, um, but this is kind of a rule of thumb. And you see things, you know, again, how big is my search index going to be? Anyone have search indexes this big? Right, one. One. So most people are kind of either in this phase or sub 10 million. And sub 10 million is kind of interesting because you need very little infrastructure. Most of the infrastructure you're going to deploy when you're below 10 million items is purely for high availability. It doesn't offer you anything else really in terms of, oh, it's not a requirement that you have. You need it for additional processing needs. It's all about high availability. But it's only when you start to scale out to these kind of sizes. You know, Microsoft MSIT, you've got a farm that's sitting up there with about 37 search components in it in total. It's just way, way overbuilt. You would never, in, you know, you would build that if you needed it, but typically 95% of all search deployments probably don't get anywhere near that scale. Another one in terms of sizing for the databases, what you'll notice is the crawl DBs are actually very small by comparison with 2010. In 2010, a, a crawl DB, um, I had one crawl DB that was way outside the support boundaries at about 90 million items crawled through it and it was about 670 gig in size. It was an enormous thing. And that was even after kind of truncating the log and everything else. The reason these don't get so big now is because we keep significantly less crawl history in the logs in the database, and we keep significantly less, or in fact, we keep zero anchor data in there, because it's all done by analytics. So there's less information in these databases. And uh, like I say, this is, this is mainly for reference. I want to get down to the demo before we run out of time. Um, and then scaling for performance, this is really a logical extension of what we've already seen. So if I've got a query processing component and I'm measuring its performance and my query latency is telling me it's slow, on Monday we briefly looked at some of the query latency reports, then what do I want to do? Well, I might add another query processing component. So I'm now getting double the through, potentially double the throughput. Now I might, my bottleneck might move from query processing now onto the actual indexer itself because I've got two components talking to the indexer. I might need to spread that out again. So it's all about logically following the path. And at some point, you'll reach, you'll reach the, the ideal optimum for your business. It isn't always about just deploying more. You know, sometimes it, if you measure the metrics, sometimes it might be a case of, well, I don't necessarily need to put more of these things in. I just need to make them, make them bigger or add another replica to my index rather than add another partition to the index. So there's a subtle difference there in terms of what that gives you from a throughput perspective. So I want to try and demo this. And we should get some time to hopefully touch on um, search extensibility. So what I'm going to build, this is my demo environment. This is the one we just built. I'm going to scale out the fast one to prove that it is a real database and it is a real components in there. So we've got all of our components on one machine and our four DBs at the bottom. And I'm going to build a non-ideal architecture. So I'm not going to build something to best practices, or, well, sorry, to, to preferred practice. 
I'm just going to build something that just shows we can, we can do crazy stuff. So I'm going to build this. I'm going to turn that into that, just with a few, well, several PowerShell commands and about 10 minutes, hopefully. So we'll see what we do. And again, it's just, you know, it's not, a, it's not ideal. If you compared this, this deployment with that chart I showed you with the stars on, they'd be flagging red flags everywhere because it's not, it's not ideal, but it, but it should work fine. So let's see how we do it. So here's our topology. We're going to use exactly the same one we upgraded from fast. Here's our server, single server. And what I have is a whole bunch of PowerShell. So behind here, this is my scale out. So I'm going to walk through, scale out search. And one thing I'm going to do is export the topology. I would always recommend you do that. If you export the topology, it basically gives you a XML file, which is a snapshot of the current search configuration in terms of the topology. So you can always go and replay it back if you need to. It's also an interesting way to avoid doing a whole pile of PowerShell. Because if you, I'll show you that file at the end of this demo. If you look at that file, it's XML, and it contains definitions of all the components. You can go in and edit that file to add other components in. It's so simple. You then import that topology, and you'll do all, the, all this work that we do with PowerShell will be done before you behind the scenes. So I'll show, I'll show you that in a second. So all I'm going to do here is start my service. In fact, let me, did I run that? Let me just make sure I run that. So I've exported the topology. Just make sure I'm seeing that thing down there. I will start the services on my other two machines. So I've got SP1 and SP2. Uh, sorry, SP1 running right now. I need SP2 and SP3 running. And I'm going to did I start them? Sorry, I'm losing track because of all the scrolling. just shrink this guy up so he can see it a bit better. <laughs> Not that way. Let me do this. Sorry, I don't know. I don't know whether it's just me as a presenter, but everyone else, I probably have problems with this as well. So I'm just going to now get the status. So once I start the services, I just want to make sure the status, and we can, they're actually starting, we can see here that they're online. If they didn't show online, they'd show provisioning, and eventually they'd start, or they'd just completely fail. One thing we need to do with search, because the search topology is active, we can't just make modifications to an active topology. So what we do is we clone it. We create a copy of the topology that we already have. So I'll get, grab the topology here, and then I'll clone it into a new, well, basically grab it into a new variable. And if I look at the two services, the two components, what we should see, or the two topologies, is that all, apart from the creation date and the GUID the ID, they're the same. If I was to go and iterate through all the components, we'd see that they're all the same. So it's basically just a copy. It's an inactive copy of that, of that topology. So then I can start doing things with, the, with that copy. I can add crawl component. So I'm just going to blast through these. Okay. I can add a new content processing component. And all I'm providing is the topology that I want to modify and which particular search host I want that to exist on. I'm then going to add some additional um, query processing components. So this is all driving towards that diagram that we, we built, we showed you previously. I'm going to add a second admin service, which gives me high availability for that service, which is something we never had in SharePoint 2010. And I'm then going to scale out that partition. So the only thing that matters with the partitions perspective is this number at the end specifically. If I was to add, a, if I was to change one of them zeros to a one, I would effectively split that partition into two parts and create partitions of zero and partition one. So in this case, I'm not too concerned with that. It's a relatively small deployment. It's a very small deployment. I'm just going to stick with a single partition, but provide two additional replicas. So at this point, I'm basically providing myself with the ability to, to have not only HA or high availability for querying, but also provide myself with potentially more queries per second through the engine as well, because they can all serve, serve queries in parallel. And then I'm going to move the analytics processing component. So because we already have an analytics processing in this topology, but it's on a server that I don't want it to be on, I need to delete it. I need to remove it. So I'm just going to grab its reference and then remove it. And yes, I want to do that. I could have put you know, confirm false on there, and it would just go. And then I want to create a new one on a different server. And then finally, I want to add a couple of crawl databases, another links database, Come on, this takes a few minutes. That just takes a few seconds, actually. So there's our first one.
Hopefully it won't be too long. Let's go and look at SQL. No, 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 no. Sorry, folks, I'm getting a bit all over the place here. There we go. Let's go and look at SQL. So if I look in SQL Server, I should start to see those databases I requested to be created. There's our crawl store two. Crawl store three should appear shortly. Hopefully, long PowerShell window. So there's crawl store three. Cancel. I don't know what I did there. Okay, I just pressed the wrong button. Ignore the red. I think I pressed the wrong button. My record of demos isn't going well this week. Okay, right. Anyway, the component's created. Let me just have it show you the topology. No, that's our uh, old topology. So the final step, and I'm not convinced this is going to work because I think I run into a problem. The final step, after you've added all the components in, is to activate it. And at that point, all of what will happen is the search topology that we had previously will um, all of the um, re all of the information that's in there. The, for example, the the information in the search indexes, the on disk indexes, will it won't go anywhere, but will effectively propagate to the, to have a new identity. The index component will have a new identity. All of the pieces around the search service topology will gain the identities of the components we've just created. So I'm hoping it's going to work. I think I've fat fingered my PowerShell, but we'll see what happens. This, this in the upstairs before this session took about 10 minutes to complete. So I'm going to go back to the slides. But fundamentally, that's all you need to do. Clone the topology that you already have, add the components you need, remove the components you don't want, and then activate the topology, and then just sit and wait. Sorry, Matt, it's just a question here. So if you act, so if you if you, uh, they both do the same thing, yeah. Or like that. Not that I'm aware of. So, yeah, it's the same process. So, okay. So the question, if you didn't hear it down here, was: Is there any difference between calling just activate on the topology versus calling set? And it's no. The process is exactly the same. So just while that's running, I'll show you quickly. Show you that XML file that we downloaded. I can find everything else on this machine. So the topology file that we downloaded contains information about, so we have issue of our search service application information and all of our components and which server they're running on. And if I wanted to change this, if, so if I, would, if I was to open this in Notepad, for example, and I thought, well, actually, no, I want another component here. I'm going to copy this section, paste it in again, give it a different server name and a different name, so a comp search server component or crawl component four, for example, give it a different name and then run imports enterprise search service application topology, it would run all of that commands that we've just done and then add this component in without having to do all that PowerShell. It would be a one-step process. But it's slightly more risky in that you don't know if you're going to, you know, you could make a problem, you could make a mistake in the file. Unlike me making a mistake in PowerShell. So I don't think we'll be provisioned yet, although we might be. So let's go and have a look. It's either not worked or or I've been very lucky and it's run very quickly. I think it's not worked. No. Damn. So I've got my databases. All right. So, all right. That, apologies, that should have worked. It worked in the speaker room previously. What we should see here is, I'm actually really annoyed with myself, but what we should see here is you would see the different servers and you would see tick marks or check marks in where all the different components are. And if they're all green, you're good to go. If any of them have got red X's on, there's a problem. Maybe the service isn't started on that machine. If any of them are showing warning triangles, and Victor here, um, we had a discussion about this in January. If they start showing warning triangles one day and then they don't the next, 
it's probably because you've not got a firewall rule opening allowing .NET connectivity, the WCF connectivity, to the admin service. And you're getting weird scenarios, especially if you've got two admin services. You might be able to communicate to one but not the other. So you get this flip-flop where sometimes the components are offline and sometimes they're on. So just check that out. So, ugh, if anyone wants to see that demo, I'll do it again at lunchtime. It does work. <laughs> or if you want the scripts, you might not. Um, so the final thing was really just to look at content transformation services. So I know someone asked about, are we gonna talk about this? Now, I am by no means a dev, right? I'm probably the worst dev in this room, and that is not a joke. So in terms of pipeline extensibility, the kind of information that I can give you with is really just the, the touch points in terms of what we can do and what we can't do. So the key thing with pipeline extensibility is the, 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 the content transformation service allows us to make a call out based on a series of rules that are used to say, okay, well, I'm gonna, I wanna augment my, ser my, my search index with maybe a different set of manage, man, um, managed properties, or I'm gonna change a managed property, or add uh, information into a managed property field that I can't get from inside SharePoint, but I know that when I crawl a particular item and a particular trigger gets hit that says this value equals X, whatever it might be, I'll reach out to a web service, I'll get the data I'm looking for from that remote web service, I'll pull that data down and I'll update the managed property to contain that information. And that is pretty much in a nutshell as far as we can go with pipeline extensibility in search. Obviously what that web service does behind the scenes could be a whole range of things. But the more things you ask that web service to do, the more problems you might have with crawl because it's gonna take longer to run. So you need to just be aware of that. So there's one single call out, that's it, as far as extensibility is concerned. So if you're used to fast, if you used to fast ESP, this is hopeless. If you used to fast search for 2010, then it's not great, but it's, you know, we could only extend the fast search for 2010 pipeline at the end of the pipeline, and we couldn't do an awful lot with it. Um, but it's certainly more limited than either of those solutions. And when you're using the web service, the thing you need to think about is, oh, hang on, sorry. When you're using it, the process is very simple in terms of what actually happens. You the, so the admin registers a set of rules using these commandlets. Once those rules have been registered, as I said already, it works with managed properties, so you basically define what's my input managed property and what's my output managed property. So when a certain value gets set, as I said already, it, it triggers an event, if you like, or it triggers the reach out to the web service that brings back some data that updates a managed property. And that, kind of said, that's already, that's kind of the, the whole flow. In terms of design considerations, if you don't build, if you want to do this and you build it poorly, you will cripple your crawl service. The key things are, make sure you've got um, limitations or limit the number of potential calls. So we're going to build in triggers. Don't fire this call on every single bloody item you're going to index because you're just going to cripple the server. Make sure that you build an effective set of triggers such that it only fires when absolutely necessary. Make sure that the call itself is, is performance, so you don't, want to, you don't want to be hitting a web service that's extremely slow or extremely busy. Make sure that if that web service is gonna be really busy, make sure it's load balanced, make sure it can service the requests in sufficient time. Um, okay, and that's kind of it in terms of content transformation. So, um, question time. I overran by two minutes. <laughs>